friends, you know me to be neither rash nor impulsive. I'm not given to wild, unsupported statements. And I tell you that we must evacuate this planet immediately. It's the only answer, Lara. If he remains here with us, he will die as surely as we will. But why Earth, you? They're primitives, thousands of years behind them. You will need that advantage to survive. Death of innocent people? No. By causing the death of innocent people. Superman the movie was released across the United States and most parts of the world on the 15th of December 1978 and was a huge success for Warner Brothers, breaking many box office records and reigned as Warner's most successful film for years. Produced on the biggest budget at the time, it had a huge cast of big names and classic actors, costing over $50 million, down to the producers wanting to make two Superman movies back to back. Everything about the movie was epic. It was a perfect example of a blockbuster. With director Richard Donner at the helm, the movie's success rocketed him to stardom in Hollywood. He went on to have great success with the Lethal Weapon series, and he became the first director to have his films make a billion dollars at the box office. He was offered every comic book movie in sight, but he turned them all down. But later through the years, he helped as an executive producer on X-Men, and his company actually produced the X-Men and Wolverine films. So he still has a connection to superhero movies. Christopher Reeve became a star overnight. He ignored the advice from fellow actors about taking on the role of a comic book character and earned their respect when everyone saw how good he was. Christopher Reeve took the role very seriously and was very respectful to the source material. When it came to the Oscars, Superman was nominated for its music, visual effects, sound and film editing. It rightly won an Outstanding Achievement Award for its state-of-the-art visual effects. It was the first time people got to see a man fly on screen and to many people at the time the effects looked real and left many baffled how they achieved it. Richard Donner at the time was furious the Academy ignored the talents of John Barry, the production designer and the cinema photographer Jeffrey Onsworth, who both sadly passed away before the film was released. If you go and browse the list of nominations that year and check who'd won, you'd be just as furious and shocked by how John and Jeffrey were ignored. It unfortunately goes with many science fiction and fantasy films. The Academy often don't consider this genre a serious contender for awards, like for best film or screenplay. I personally think the Academy should award artists and technicians for providing audiences with something spectacular or visuals people have never seen before, and above all something original. The look of Krypton is incredible, the daring photography by Jeffrey on the outfits the Kryptonians wear, to the beautiful landscape of Smallville, to the bustling streets of Metropolis, where the filtered soft smoky look of the first half is toned down 
for a more pastel-coloured dreamy look that helped define the look of the Superman series. For the film's story, which everyone knows, on the dying planet Krypton, using evidence provided by scientist jor the ruling council sentenced General Zod, Ursa and Non to eternal living death in the Phantom Zone. Despite his eminence, jor is unable to convince the council of his belief that Krypton will soon explode. To save his infant son Kal-El, jor launches a spacecraft containing the child towards Earth. A distant planet with a suitable atmosphere and where Kal-El's dense molecular structure will give him superhuman powers. Shortly after the launch, Krypton is destroyed. Three years later, the ship lands near an American farming town, Smallville, where Kal-El is found by Jonathan and Martha Kent. The Kents take the child back to their farm and raise him as their own son, naming him Clark. At age 18, soon after the death of Jonathan, Clark hears a psychic call, discovering a glowing green crystal in the remains of his ship. It compels him to travel to the Arctic, where the crystal builds the Fortress of Solitude, resembling the architecture of Krypton. Inside, a vision of jor explains Clark's origins, educating him in his powers and responsibilities. After 12 years, his powers are fully developed. Clark leaves the fortress wearing his costume and becomes a reporter for the Daily Planet in Metropolis. He meets and develops an attraction to co-worker Lois Lane, but she sees him as awkward and unsophisticated. During the process, a policeman and his colleague were planning to arrest Otis to locate Lex Luthor. The cops follow Otis to the train station. Otis travels along the train track and enters Luthor's lair through a hidden entrance. One of the cops notices and attempts to get inside, but Lex is watching him and eliminates him by pushing him in front of a train. Later that evening, Lois becomes involved in a helicopter accident where conventional means of rescue are impossible, requiring Clark to use his powers in public for the first time to save her. The rescue of Air Force One and other good deeds make the mysterious caped wonder a celebrity. The hero visits Lois at her home taking her for a flight over the city and allows her to interview him for an article in which she names him Superman. Meanwhile, criminal genius Lex Luthor has developed a cunning plan to make a fortune in real estate by buying large amounts of barren desert land and then diverting a nuclear missile test flight to the San Andreas Fault. The missile will sink California and leave Luthor's desert as the new west coast of the United States. Superman attempts to stop him but doesn't realise Lex has kryptonite. When Superman came to be broadcast on TV during the early 80s on channels such as the ABC network, the film was increased in length to boost revenue from advertisements, and the first showing of Superman was spread over two evenings. The running length came to three hours in length, and during the later part of the 80s and I think early 90s, an even slightly longer cut was shown in parts of Europe and Australia. People often refer to this version as the international cut. There is extended scenes of Krypton featuring new sequences of dialogue and of the Krypton security guard, which did turn up on the DVD release in 2001. There were two great Zoptic shots of Superman that were left out of the theatrical cut. Just after Superman saves the helicopter and he flies off, and the media catches him as he does, he flies past camera and the visual effect is impressive, and the lighting matches the background as he passes a skyscraper. The other is when Superman attempts to stop the rocket. He flies down in front of it, but it dodges him, leaving Superman a bit puzzled, as he then chases after it. There are loads of other moments that were obviously trimmed for pacing issues, especially as the cops follow Otis. The earthquake sequence has many moments cut out, and for good reason. Some come across as a bit campy and cheesy, and it does affect the flow of the movie. There is one scene I loved when Superman saves Jimmy, and he lets him take a photograph of the destruction of the dam, which I think would have been nice to have been left in. When I first started using the internet on a regular basis during the late 90s, there was reports of Warners actually re-releasing Superman back into theatres, in a limited run which Superman fans were very excited by, with the prospect of seeing it on the big screen, but to many of us we were too young to have seen it at the cinema, or like me, weren't even born. To many people they grew up with Superman on the small screen, watching the film over the Christmas period or the Easter holidays. So to have a chance to see Christopher Reeve flying on the big screen was a dream come true, but Warner Brothers decided against it, despite actually making a good trailer to promote its re-release. Some claim they chickened out and didn't think it would have worked, or it would have interfered with their plans for a new Superman film. Warner Brothers' plans from the beginning was to release it on DVD. To many they had not seen Superman in widescreen. For the fans in the USA, 
they had to own a Laserdisc player to get a chance to see it, or for people like me in the UK, it was released on VHS in the early 90s, which my dad thankfully bought for me on my birthday one year. The DVD release had a lot of hype, down to it being remastered and featuring all new documentaries. The new cut featured new scenes, but to many, say, hardcore Superman movie fans, they had already seen many of these scenes down to the fans online sharing the TV cuts with each other. But it was now a chance to see them in widescreen and all cleaned up. The editor and supervisor of this DVD release was Michael Thor, who later went on to work on the Donner cut of Superman 2. The scenes he put back in into this new cut left many divided and I personally think affected the pace of the movie. I enjoyed all the new Krypton content, the stuff with his mother in the morning attempting to wake up Clark, however doesn't work at all and the lighting is totally different in the next shot. The scene where Kal-El talks to Jor-El about his first night out as Superman, I always enjoy watching. It's a great moment between father and son and strengthens their relationship when it comes to Superman 2. And plus it's always good seeing more of Marlon Brando. When Superman first encounters Lex Luthor, he is led into a trap and gets shot at, set on fire and frozen. The effects in this scene are amazing for the time and adds the extra element of traditional comic book action. But the scene before where Lex, Otis and Miss Tessmacher discuss Superman's weaknesses. Otis says fire and bullets can't hurt this guy, so it kind of makes this scene redundant because Lex knows his trap won't affect Superman and the editor Stuart Baird probably cut it out for that reason. But hey, it's still a great scene. The DVD came with a new remastered 5.1 Dolby mix and it also featured new sound effects. The new sounds kick in straight away during the title sequence. Many jokingly said it sounded like someone slamming a door when the Superman logo blasts on screen. There were also new sounds for the destruction of Krypton and many of the action scenes later on. It was all professionally done and many enjoy the new mix. I still prefer the old 70s mix but it's still fun to enjoy the film in full 5.1 surround sound. It's good to have the option to change from the old to the new mix. The late 70s filmmakers were really starting to push the boundaries of visual effects and introducing new techniques such as motion control, which was used heavily in Star Wars. Also new techniques with slit scan and large format celluloid. The technicians on Superman had a tough task of making you believe a man could fly. At the time, people had seen people flying on screen, but in a very flat and uninspired way, very much like the TV show of Superman from the 50s. The visual effects at the time were state of the art, and for a TV show budget were exceptional, but you couldn't really do much with the actor they would lay flat and you just had the backdrop whizzing past. The show did use a technique that was later used in the movies which had the actor laying in a mould of their body with an extended arm sticking out of the projection screen so you didn't have to use wires. But obviously you were limited with movement and you couldn't be creative with your camera setups without giving away the effect. And with the effects team in the 70s using a combination of optical effects for Superman flying into the distance or doing sharp turns but when it came to the main method of Superman flying front projection was the chosen method. However, they still faced a problem of having Reeve actually fly in front of the camera. FX wizard Zoran Perisic patented a new refinement to front projection that involved placing a zoom lens on both the movie camera and the projector. These zoom lenses are synchronized to zoom in and out simultaneously in the same direction. As the projection lens zooms in, it projects a smaller image on the screen. The camera lens zooms in at the same time and to the same degree so that the projected image, the background plate, appears unchanged as seen through the camera. However, the subject placed in front of the front projection screen appears to have moved closer to the camera. Thus Superman flies towards it. Zoran called this technique Zoptic. The process was used again in Superman 2 and 3. Many of the backgrounds were shot in 35mm, so there are moments where it looks very grainy and they have undercranked the camera to speed up the film and it gives a very shaky result. Superman 2 was a big improvement with the Zoptics thanks to the effects team using large format film and less use of speeding up of the background plates. But the first film is definitely far more creative with its flying shots. The greatest special effect in the film is Christopher Reeve himself. He moves in a very fluid way and doesn't look stiff and uncomfortable. He banks his body during the scenes and moves elegantly when he takes off and lands. If he didn't move in this way then the whole effect wouldn't have worked. Over the years there's been many actors flying on screen, the Matrix trilogy, Hook, other superhero flicks and even the more recent Superman films. 
Hook was pretty effective when it came to the flying scenes, with lots of wire work, but the majority of them the actors all look stiff as a board. When it comes to the flying, the actors all look extremely uncomfortable, or say 80% of the movie they are replaced with a CGI counterpart. It just makes Christopher Reeve's efforts that more special. He's on wires sometimes nearly 200 feet in the air, and doing it without a stunt double. Nowadays I'm guessing they wouldn't let actors do it down to health and safety reasons. Christopher Reeve is still the only actor to look believable on screen when it comes to flying. Everyone else is pretty average at best. Superman the movie, like many movies at the time, used a lot of miniatures, provided by the legendary Derek Meddings. All the stuff on Krypton is amazing. The destruction of the dam and the bridge really sell the visuals, and I would say 85% of the time they look real. Their sense of scale is rarely given away. But Derek didn't complete the final shots of Superman attempting to stop the river from damaging the town below. Derek left to work on the next James Bond film, and they were handled by a different team for the final scenes, and they do unfortunately look pretty bad. It's like watching a subpar version of Thunderbirds. The scale is given away and the lighting doesn't really match the previous stuff Derek shot. It's definitely the weakest effects in the movie. John Williams has provided some of the best film scores over the last 40 years. He really came to the public's attention with his work on Jaws in 1975, but it was Star Wars in 1977 that made him a household name. If you are a big fan of film soundtracks, then I guarantee you probably own most of his work during the 70s and 80s. Superman the movie came along when John Williams was at the peak of his success. With Star Wars and with the recent release of Close Encounters, John Williams was on a high pumping out incredible music, and Superman the movie to many is one of John's best film scores. I've had many friendly arguments with other fans deciding which is the best soundtrack he has produced. E.T., Jurassic Park, Hook, Star Wars Trilogy and the Indiana Jones series. They are all great masterpieces, but Superman the movie to me has his best work. The theme tune created for Superman was a masterstroke. The music cleverly speaking the word Superman as the title roars onto screen. The theme tune has become so associated with the character it's hard to imagine seeing Superman on screen without that theme tune accompanying him. With superhero films the last 15 years, many composers have had the chance to create recognisable themes to go along with these characters, but many of the scores produced don't really create something that is truly memorable, or even leaves you humming the theme after viewing it. It may be down to how film scores have changed over the years. I feel there is a certain lack of creativity in film music today. This is not to discredit the composers working at the moment, but there seems to be nothing really special anymore with many of these superhero soundtracks. There is the odd one or two that make me smile and feel excited, but these moments are very few and far between. But a good theme tune can't make the whole of the soundtrack amazing, it has to have other moments that stand out, and pretty much all the tracks on Superman thankfully are recognisable and very memorable. You have the epic theme of Krypton and its destruction, the emotional moments where Jor-El says goodbye to Kal-El, the spaceship travelling to Earth, the wheat fields of Kansas, the death of Jonathan, and Clark's decision to leave home and travel north. This music is only for the first 40 minutes of the film, and you're given so much music to accompany the amazing visuals, you can listen to the soundtrack without watching the film and picture every scene in your head. My personal favourite track out of the entire score is The Fortress of Solitude. It starts out epic and slowly builds up to an atmospheric sound which leaves you relaxed and chilled, and then the theme tune kicks in when Superman is revealed. The love theme is just as strong as Superman's main march. It really comes into effect during the romantic flying scene between Lois and Superman. The song that plays over this sequence is a bit cheesy and corny, and definitely a product of its time, but it does have its charm and it never really bothered me, and it's just there to please the female audience who would hopefully be invested in the romantic aspect of the story. If you are a fan of film music, this is the perfect soundtrack to showcase John Williams being incredibly creative, and it really stirs your imagination when you listen to it. Forget about all the new superhero soundtracks, there is nothing out there today that even comes close to John's work. The score is easily available on iTunes. To me, Superman the movie became more important over time, due to many studios producing comic book flicks on a yearly basis. Superhero movies seem to be keeping Hollywood afloat these days. Many comic book movies had great success and some have failed. The ones that succeed stayed faithful to the source material, and the directors involved were heavily inspired by Superman. Directors Sam Raimi, Brian Singer, John Favreau, Martin Campbell and Christopher Nolan are all fans of Richard Donner's work. 
Christopher Nolan even went out of his way to speak to Richard Donner for a featurette on a recent Batman trilogy Blu-ray box set. You can see how happy Christopher Nolan is when he's chatting with Dick Donner. He has the look of a big kid chatting with his idol, and rightly so. Many filmmakers should thank him and the crew for setting the standard on how to treat a comic book movie with its translation to film. To me and to many, the main selling point of the movie is Christopher Reeve's incredible performance as Superman and Clark Kent. If he wasn't cast in the role, the whole movie would have never worked and wouldn't have had the success it had. In my personal opinion, out of all the actors throughout film history who have played superheroes, Chris is the only actor who makes you believe that they are the character and probably the only actor to fully resemble his comic book counterpart. Comic book artists became inspired by his look. They started drawing their versions of Superman to resemble him. Take a look at John Bryan's work in the late 80s and the more recent stuff by artist Gary Frank. There are obviously great actors at the moment such as Robert Downey Jr as Iron Man who is very entertaining but Chris had the more challenging role of playing Clark and Superman and creating a difference between them and taking on a lot of the flying effects himself. The introduction of Superman and his first appearance to the general public is still outstanding and has dated very well over time and still works extremely well today. With so many comic book movies out there, none really match that introduction of its lead character. By all means, they are still entertaining and fun to watch, but none leave you in such awe and excitement. It captured what Superman is all about, saving people in a heroic fashion. Superman the movie will always be my number one favourite superhero film, and probably my all-time favourite movie in general. I often slip between this and Ghostbusters, but I think Superman just does everything right in my eyes. It's a film I grew up with, so there is always going to be that nostalgic factor, but the more I watched the movie in my youth, the more I learned about visual effects and the way movies are made. When you become slightly obsessive over a movie, you start making great efforts to research its production, and Superman the movie was covered heavily when it was released. Some magazines such as American Cinema Photographer were extremely helpful, and the documentary on the DVD featuring Roy Field is a nice educational experience. It's always nice to have an understanding of how many of the practical effects were achieved, and the movie especially was very helpful to me when it came to cutting action. The editor Stuart Baird is still one of the best in the business, providing his talents on Casino Royale and Skyfall, and during the 80s and 90s, he was the go-to guy to edit action. Superman the movie is epic from the get-go. It doesn't play things down or plays it safe. It gives you everything you want from a Superman movie and doesn't hold back. The cast is stellar and everyone is believable as the characters they are portraying. The film is faithful to its source material. The first 45 minutes are treated very seriously and when he becomes Superman, the film jumps straight into a comic book. Some may argue that the tone is inconsistent because everything beforehand was played so straight but I think the comedic and sort of campy style help balance it out and make it more appealing to a wider audience. The film needed to inject a sense of fun and humour, and you get that straight away when Clark meets Lois. The relationship between Superman and Lois is very natural. You believe they are in love, and when Superman forgets about her near the end and when she dies, you can see the heartache and pain he has put himself through and breaks his number one rule of not interfering with human history and reverses time. The reversing time idea is incredibly silly and also Superman doesn't face any consequences for his actions because he can just reverse time again. It's like a get out of jail free card. Now obviously fans know the reversing time idea was for Superman 2 and originally the villains were set to be freed at the end of the first flick but due to Warner Brothers not feeling the film had a solid ending the idea of reversing time and Lois dying was moved forward. The reversing time idea is definitely the film's most problematic scene and causes many debates. But it's handled well, and because you care about the characters, you want Superman to return things back to normal. Jim Bowers, who owns the CapeWonder.com website, is currently in the process of producing a photographic journal on Richard Donner's years working on Superman 1 and 2. Jim has hundreds of rare on-set photos and images he has collected over the years, which will be featured. There are currently a few houses who are very interested in publishing the book, and Richard Donner has written the foreword and given his blessing. Warners will hopefully approve it, and fans of the film will be able to enjoy this ultimate Superman treasure. To me and a generation who grew up watching Superman the movie, it will always hold a special place in our hearts. It always puts a big smile on my face every time I watch it, and I love showing the film to friends who have never seen it and watching their faces light up when Christopher Reeve bursts into action. It still manages to impress 35 years on. Chris will always be Superman to me and to many people throughout the world. 
and I hope future generations won't ignore the film because they think it's old. The movie inspired filmmakers who own the business today and I hope it will continue to impress future generations. He'll be fast, virtually invulnerable. Isolated, alone. He will not be alone. He will never be alone. Yeah, I know, you can do all these amazing things and sometimes you think that you will just go bust unless you can tell people about it. And there's one thing I do know, son, and that is you are here for a reason. Why are you here? There must be a reason for you to be here. Yes, hmm? I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. This country is safe against Superman, thanks to you. Clark said that you're just a figment of somebody's imagination, like Peter Pan. They can be a great people, Kal-El, they wish to be. They only lack the light to show the way. For this reason, above all, their capacity for good. I have sent them you, my only son.